Welcome to Focus on Fancy Romance, episode number 37, a podcast where we discuss books, genre, industry, and our geeky lives. I'm your host, Al Klaus. I'm A.R.D. Clerk. I'm Paulina Wood. And Ishabel is waving. <laughs> today we have <laughs> today we have an audiobook narrator, Holly Jackson. Holly, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, uh, Holly Jackson. That's what I go by. Um, I write under the pseudonym H.R. Jackson, and I've been doing this for now. I've got over 400 books. Uh, I've worked for you. What is it? New York Times bestsellers and USA Today bestsellers, and yeah, I'm coming up on my fifth year soon. Yeah, <laughs> in my fifth year. Um, yeah, so I've been doing this for a little while, and I love what I do, and books. Okay, <laughs> yeah. How did you get into doing audiobooks? Um, I actually got into doing audiobooks uh, by accident. Um, when we published our first book, um, The Nemesis Chronicles, we went and... My dad had said something about uh, an online service that did it for free, which was Patio Books. And so I went and I recorded the first, the first book for that. And Minutes to Midnight did really, really well. Uh, people kept saying, you know, maybe you should do this full time. And so I started there. And it's just kind of ballooned from there. <laughs> did you have any, um, like, theater background? Um, actually, my background is more, I was a phone actress for almost a decade, a little over a decade. So those, um, telephone sex lines? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was the naughty voice on the other end of the phone. So Well, I imagine that comes in handy when you're uh, narrating something of the erotic nature. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I get asked all the time, I get, um, people who say, you know, there's an explicit scene in here. Are you okay with that? And I'm like, honey, things? <laughs> and I've had to say some things, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> so you said you've been at this for five years. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I imagine that you've learned a lot throughout the uh, course of your career. How has your Absolutely. process changed from when you first started to uh, now? Like accepting clients. There's a lot, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, before, I used to do a lot of going out, and I would have to do the audition. So I would have to find the projects and solicit and all of that. Um, now it's more they come to me than I go to them. Um, generally, the process is a little bit more streamlined now because uh, I have more people who they already know what they want. They know if they're willing to pay or if they're just wanting a royalty share. Uh, I do a lot of work for Tantor, which is one of the big three, and generally they just contact me and say, here, have this book, and I'm like, okay, and as long as they pay me, I'm fine. And then from there, uh, I guess process is pretty, pretty much the same after that. As, long as, I get, as soon as I get a manuscript, I start doing some prep work, find out all the characters, find out if there's any accents or anything that need to be taken care of, um, and then read through get an idea, get a feel for the book itself, and then record. And as I'm finishing a chapter, my husband, who does all the producing for it now, um, he makes sure that it's all the breaths are fine and the pacing is fine and all of the technical requirements are taken care of, and then we just upload and go. It's pretty straightforward. So you mentioned you work for Tantor, and I met you. Um, I was recommended to you by Renee Mason, who's going to be on next week, mm -hmm. um, because you write uh, narrate in my genre, and I contacted you through oh yes through ACX, which is the I guess the the backside of um, Audible. Yes. Um, so I know you you take well at the moment you take. <laughs> Royalty share, but you do a per finished hour. Is that correct? I do both, actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, do you have a vetting process? So, if someone reaches out to you and says, "Hey, I like your narrating style. I've got this book," uh, do you have a vetting process? 
Uh, I have a little bit of one. Um, when I was first starting, I was more of a, I was more open into just give me whatever you've got. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, just trying to build that base. Um, but now, um, generally what I try to do as far as vetting, I take a look at how the book is doing, um, if the author has any other work. If it's somebody that I've worked with before, generally it's an automatic yes. Um, I don't think there's anybody that I've ever really like turned down that I've worked for before because I really enjoy. So if it's somebody I've done before and I've enjoyed their work, it's an automatic yes for sure. Uh, beyond that, I mean, I try to look at, I'm not, as, I'm not as, as nitpicky I think as some narrators can be about like editing and grammar and stuff like that because I know that Sometimes, you know, the editor's going to miss something. Even the best editors miss stuff all the time. So I'm not super picky about that. I, I like the story to like the story. I like to be able to get immersed into the story and have a good plot. Um, I think that's really my main requirement is if I enjoy the story enough. Um, blurbs do come in handy, but I've found that sometimes blurbs don't tell the whole story about the story inside. So <laughs> I generally, you know, I... I'm not very, I'm not super picky about what I get. I mean, there's some, there's some narrators out there who are, who are absolutely, you know, if it's not within, you know, selling the top 100 or whatever of, of Amazon sales or anything like that, they won't do it. But I'm a little bit more lax than that because I know you never know where you're going to find a good story. Yeah, I know that um, I had someone re go through and reread uh, Stealing Wolfprints, which you did my audiobook for, and right. they found typos. And this is after you had already done, mm -hmm. you had done your, your read through. And I'm like, I didn't notice any of these typos during the read through. So you must have right. uh, either my corrected them or. I'm like, oh, my brain goodness. does autocorrect, believe it or not. Um, when I was in high school, I was actually I was editor in chief of the newspaper. And I would sit there and my brain autocorrects. It, it's the funniest thing because, you know, um, Dragon has actually seen me do it while I'm reading out loud. And it's like my brain will see something. If it seems weird, um, I'll fix it. So my inner, my inner editor comes out. So I don't, I don't, <laughs> it's rare when I won't fix something if it's obvious that it needs to be fixed. But generally, you know, I'll read it exactly as it's in front of me. But I do. My brain autocorrects. And sometimes I don't even know I'm doing it until afterwards. Well, I'm probably sure that you probably saved yourself a lot of corrections, having to go back and correct <laughs> your audio. Um, but that's my question. So I'm going to uh, have Amy ask something. Um, OK, so I don't really have a lot of questions, only because <laughs> I don't listen to audiobooks, And so right. <laughs> I don't really know that much about audiobooks or how they work mm -hmm. or what they sound like or what the process is. But right. um, is there a genre in particular that you haven't done as much that you wish you could do more of? Actually, yes. I would like to do more nonfiction. Um, I've done a lot of fiction. Well, pretty much everything I've done has been exclusively fiction. Um, I do a lot of paranormal romance. I do a lot of urban fantasy. I do a lot of um, – I'm getting into cozies. Uh, which right now I've done a bunch of them for Dakota Cassidy and I think Renee, Renee George, and I love the heck out of those. Those are quite a bit of fun. Um, but I haven't really gotten to get into the nonfiction, like the historical biographies and stuff like that. I would love to do something like that, and I haven't been able to. I haven't been able to get into that as much. I was hoping you were going to say so that would be nice. steampunk. <laughs> Oh, I love steampunk. Are you kidding? I've done, oh. I've done steampunk. She's done um, one of steampunk. I've done a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done, I've done. I think it's like five or six different titles of steampunk. Um, I steampunk. And I, I personally love steampunk as a genre all the way around. Our books are somebody described it as steampunk, sexy steampunk with a twist. Um, so I'm, I'm down with steampunk all the way around. <laughs> When you are reading in a genre um, such as fantasy or urban fantasy, and this is actually one of Isha's mm -hmm. questions that she kind of passed along, but um, how do you deal with the pronunciation of words that are basically made up? That's a really good question. Um, I've been in love with different languages um, 
And so a lot of the grammar rules and the phonetic rules I try to apply, it, it goes out the window with things like Gaelic because, ah, uh, Gaelic. <laughs> Words that uh, letters that go together that you don't expect to make a sound that they do and they do. Um, when it's a p completely made up, I have a series that I've done. Um, Special attraction, I think, is the first one. It's by Melissa M L Ryan, um, and she has. It's called uh, the Zyzox, and it's a completely made up language. And my first thing to do is to ask if they have a pronunciation, <laughs> if the author has a particular pronunciation for it. Um, and if they don't, well, then I do the best I can with it. Um, Corsodon, which is, I guess, the, the language that's in the Special Attraction uh, series, Corsodon is uh, basically, there's very few vowels. It's mostly lots of X's and Y's, so you can imagine <laughs> It, it's a lot of fun to figure out exactly what I'm saying. Um, but for, the, for stuff like that, you know, I'll generally go right back to the author because the author has kind of an idea in their head what it should sound like. And if they have no idea, well, then it's just one of those. I'm checking Forvo and uh, the IPA and anything that I can get to get a close match to it to see how it should sound and just go from there. Yeah, Gaelic is fun because when I was writing my steampunk novel, all their spells are Gaelic. And yes. so everything is a bunch of Y's and G's that really yes. should go next to one another. And you're like, that, yes. that is spelled and so B, wrong. The, yeah, the B-H Welsh is a lot like that, too. Uh, mm -hmm. Welsh is, is basically the opposite of what Corsodon is, because Welsh is like, let's just throw a bunch of vowels. All vowels, yes. And stuff in a freaking blender and just... Out. So, yeah, I completely <sighs> understand. It's kind of a, It's kind of an interesting language. It is. Um, so tell us about when you start a project, and I think we kind of went over this a little bit already, but um, have you ever encountered an incident where um, the author had something very specific in mind and um, what you did really wasn't like what they oh, yes. wanted or what they expected? Yeah, I've had that. I've, I've I've had that come up a couple of times. Um, one of the biggest caveats I always give when I take a project is, you know, um, the voices that you hear in your head are probably not going to sound exactly like the voices that come out of me. Um, and there's a certain degree of you have to be able to let me act. But I do take into consideration, like if the, if the author, you know, mentions that, okay, so this male, male character, so much fun with those, uh, male characters say this one's, you know, gruff um, or has a slight accent or um, it comes up like with, uh, especially with English accents, a nondescript English accent. Uh, I had one where they just said English accent. Well, there's a whole bunch of different dialects in there. And I was doing just the standard posh, you know, BBC. And they were like, no, we're thinking something more like Cockney. I'm like, well, I can do Cockney. That's no problem. Um, but I've had that happen. I've had that happen where they are expecting one thing. And then when I do it, I conform as much as I can to what the author wants. That's, you know, that's my job. But <laughs> uh, at the same time, you know, there's, there's only so much I can do. So, too, I think, from both sides. Awesome. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Paulina now. I think she has some questions. Okay, so you totally said male voices, and I just have to ask, <laughs> can you give us one? A male voice. Uh, let's see. It's early enough in the day I should be able to drop my voice down just a little bit more. A lot of people, they love my English accent when I start speaking like a man. And I start bringing in all the different things, and enunciation, and pulling in the Lokis, and cutting that stuff out. Men seem to like that one. Um, women seem to like that one too. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I think it's but so yeah, yeah. My my man voice has gotten a lot better. I have I have a low register anyway, especially when I first wake up. My god, my husband gets a kick out of it all the time. He's like, I can't believe this is my wife sounding like a man over here on this. <laughs> I do it to my boyfriend sometimes, like if I'm 
doing absolutely nothing. You know, he's like laying there pissing me off. I'll just wait till he closes his eyes. I'm like, hey, baby, come on over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And he's just like, did you just, I'm like, hey, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's all good. Happiness in you. <laughs> I, I hide my balls. That's, you know, I keep them tucked. So every once in a while, I let them drop so that they can, they can come out. But yeah. Right. <laughs> Especially in erotica, oh God! Apparently, apparently, I have a way of doing in the, in the heat of the moment that my husband's like, I can't believe you're a woman when you do that. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well. <laughs> you're like, well, now we can role play, sir. Turn off the lights. <laughs> He's like, no. Mm -hmm. Do you have you done a um, a dual narration yet? A dual night? Oh yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, I think I've done about five or six of them uh, with a with a dual narrator. Do you get to pick your your narrator that you duel with, or do the author usually? Pick no, <laughs> I I have yet to pick the person that I that I've done it with. Um, usually, if it's from like Brilliance or Tantor, it'll be their choice anyway. Um, but most of the time, yeah, it's all up to the author. Um, whether or not the male and it's a little bit harder to do in royalty share uh because that's kind of tough to to divvy that up but most of the time yeah i'm basically working with whoever they they send my way so explain how that works because you're not in a studio together so do you just right, read your right. parts or the parts they ask you to read basically um for example one of the most recent ones that i did um what happened was every chapter that was from her point of view, I did, and I did both the male and female voices, but I got in contact with him ahead of time and he got in contact with me so that I could hear what his voice was, so he could hear what my voice was, so that when we go to do each other's voices, the characters in our chapters, um, we sound similar. That would annoy me, I'm so, sorry. <laughs> Just thinking it's, of that, like, Mel start speaking, I'm like, oh my God, that's not his voice. Yes, it's it's tough. It, it to me, dual narration. It, if it's done well for me, um, the dual narration that I enjoy is when like stays the male character throughout. You know what I mean? So like, even if it were in mine, um, it would be his voice responding to mine. So it would be back and forth with the lines and everything, which I think is something that they do a little bit more freely in the bigger publishing houses because they have you know teams of people who are there to do the splicing and everything for that. Production-wise, it could be a nightmare getting everything in there and getting everything, you know, normalized and leveled right. Yeah, that's true. It would be because they would have to take your audio, his audio, and kind of make mm -hmm. it perfect. Yeah, yeah, and it's it it can be tough, especially if you're working with you know people in different studios because my settings and you know on my recording equipment um, are vastly different generally than you know most anybody else's too. So and oh, all the good stuff that happens outside the studio. It can be kind of a pain in the ass all the way around if if we're doing dual narration and don't even get me started on the multiple narrators because there are some of the radio productions that are out there. Good lord. Yeah, no. So many people. <laughs> like I, I only listen to audiobooks because my younger brother and my mom have this annoying habit of going to sleep to them. So <laughs> literally if I stay at my mom's house, it's like constantly gone. And if my brother's home, I'm like, I have to wait till he goes mm -hmm. to sleep I'm down. I'm like, dude. Really? <laughs> no. And his, I, his, his one that he's listening to now is, um, I think it's Harry Potter. Is it Harry Potter? Silverillion. And like, Ooh, just the, nice. the narration on it, you know, is, is amazing. But I'm just like, oh. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites is um, the multicast narration of American Gods. I have and not it heard is, that. is it good? So good? Absolutely. It's amazing. It is so for amazing. Him. He needs a new one. I absolutely, yeah. It's it's really really good. They've got the full cast, um, the characters, the voices that they chose for the characters are freaking spot on. Mm. Um, so it's it's worth a listen. It's really really good. And I think the the other it's like fourteen one. Well, it's not fourteen hours. It's a long book. It's long, but it's it's worth it. It's a dense listen. I'll put it that way. But but the the characters uh, interacting do a really great job, and and the the production values are fantastic on it. So it's one I highly recommend. Is there a narrator that you wish you could work with more, um, either male or female, that do um, more audiobooks? 
I would love to work with like Scott Brick because his voice is amazing. Um, I've done some training with uh, Pat Fraley, who has done a lot of um, a lot of voiceover work, especially in like cartoons. Uh, I think he was the voice of Krang in the old uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle commercials, or not commercials, uh, cartoon. Uh, I've done a lot of work with him. Um, there's a male narrator that I know, Joe Hempel, who I'm I will I would love to work with because I get a kick out of him just as an individual. Um, I would love to sit down and do an audiobook with Neil Gaiman. What is I would he, absolutely adore it. What does he narrate? Uh, he narrates his own stuff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he narrates his own stuff. And, and you know, he's, he's, I don't know, there's just something about the cadence and the rhythm of his voice that I enjoy. I, I don't know but, if you belong yeah. to an audio group on Facebook, but I know one mm -hmm. of their male narrators blew up, Aaron something. I think I think I know what you're talking name. about. Yeah, his last name is is a really interesting last name. Right. It has to be he's a Czechnik or German. I swear, dude. I'm just like, like you said, those letters <laughs> go together. They do. Yeah, you're just gonna like, but how do you pronounce them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so kind of like that. But I'm I'm noticing <laughs> that a lot of narrators like yourself are starting to actually, you know, rush to the forefront which is amazing. Like they're indie narrators are not, you know, publishing house. Like, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how it goes in the narrating world, but you, the indies are picking up and running. So they really are. Um, in fact, um, I've been following it the last couple of years and there has been a major boom um, on the audiobook side, especially for indie narrators. Um, ACX has made it incredibly easy for people to become a narrator. Now, sustaining it is a little bit harder, but it's easy to get into the pool at least. Um, and there's some great talent out there. There's a lot of, uh, I think the reason why indie's taking off too for audio is there's a lot of publishing houses that won't take indie um, because they have whatever their reasons are that they have. And there's a lot of really great stories out there that aren't getting published by the big publishers um, because again, whatever their reasoning is, mm -hmm. and I've seen audiobooks take off um, all the way across the board. I've had stuff, projects that you know I looked at and went, "Well, this probably won't sell very much, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm interested in the story." And the next thing I know, it's you know sold five, six hundred copies within the first two two months that it's out, and you kind of sit back and go, "Well, I mean." People obviously like listening to it. And there's, I think it's because our, our society is getting a little bit more, people sit down and read less and they listen more now for a lot of people. So the, the taking the commutes and, and going on road trips and, you know, trying to do house cleaning around the house and stuff. My mom will turn on audiobooks just listening to it on her Alexa and she'll just sit there and listen to it while she's doing her work. So it's kind of That's creating like a backdrop. Mom. It's a different kind of music, I think. Yeah, exactly. She's, so, she always has it going. I call her. I'm like, Mom, can you please turn that down? She goes, that a good part, Mom. You've listened to this 400 times. I promise a good part. I have a hard around. time listening when I drive. When I drive, <laughs> I can't. Because I get so caught up in this story that it's like I'm, I'm not paying attention to the road as much. So yeah. I'm like, no, no. I, I'll keep that for home. <laughs> um, Amy has a question. Amy? I do actually have a question. Um, this is more of a personal question, but I'll get your feedback on it because uh, amongst ourselves in our group, we've chit chatted about it. And I kind of poo pooed the idea, but mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm going to put it out there anyway. So my publisher told me that if I wanted to do an audio book for any of my currently published books, she would do it. She told me to choose the book, choose the narrator. Mm -hmm. um, but I write in several different genres. Um, it's all right. adventure romance, but I have steampunk, fantasy, I have a paranormal, magical realism. Oh, fabulous. And science fiction romance. So, mm -hmm. in your opinion, as a narrator who has seen the market, what is the better genre to move into audiobook? I've noticed uh, in the market, the ones that seem to sell really, really well, paranormal romance um, is like the huge bulk of what I've seen. There's a push for sci-fi lately that I've been seeing. I've been getting more sci-fi projects. Um, especially sci-fi romance, because there's not a lot of that out there. Mm -hmm. um, steampunk does really well, but it's kind of a niche. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and magical realism is also getting kind of a push too, because um, urban fantasy has always been like big, but it's it's I've noticed that it seems like urban fantasy and the paranormal romance seem to be taking the lead for a lot of the stuff that's coming my way. And that's right. from the big publishers that are coming out. So, um, well, I like to play around with I, other types of punk. So, like you know, I've done you know nineteen twenties, which is deco punk and nice cyberpunk, um, future punk, mm-hmm. cyberpunk type yep. things. But um, you know, I was just kind of playing it over in my mind and trying to decide because I have all these different things out there. Oh, yeah, and yeah. just trying to decide which one. I mean, she offered to do it, and she said, you know, tell me what kind of narrator you would you hear in your head, you know, and which book you would mm-hmm. prefer and. So I've just been kind of playing with the idea. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you I very much say, for I all of your say, advice. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. Anybody else? No, I think that we've we've asked all of our questions, but we do have a giveaway. What were you, which um, audio book were you thinking about doing as a giveaway, Holly? Well, considering I have a huge, Huge catalog. Um, what I can do, I'll, you know what? I'll give away, I'll give away three codes uh, for three okay. books. Any, any that are in my in in my catalog. So I mean, I can. They're all listed. <laughs> There's a whole bunch. I've got I've got everything um, that are out there, um, just depending on what they want. Uh, but yeah, no, I can. Okay. Any, I'll, I'll give away three codes. That's fine. Okay, so the terms of the giveaway are you need to leave a question for Holly on the blog, which is at focusonfantasyromance.wordpress.com, episode 37. Um, And we'll leave it open for a month. So let's see, August 21st will be the closing date. Um, So yeah, ask Holly a question and you can win. Do you want three winners or one winner that wins three? Let's do three. Let's do three. Okay. You can win an audiobook code from any of Holly's back catalog. Is that accurate? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So where can we find you? Uh, you Gemma. can find me online at hrjackson.com. Um, that's the that's the main that'll have that has pretty much all of my books listed on it. Um, and it's currently it's it it'll be brought current again this Sunday, I think. Um, we'll be updating it again because I just had like four or five books go live. Um, and then uh, online, you can find me at uh, on Facebook under Narratrix, uh, facebook.com slash Narratrix. And on Twitter, I'm at HRJacksonTNC. And that's where I'm at Twitter. Okay. I'm all over the well, place. thank you for joining us. Yeah. Well, well you're gonna have to be. <laughs> thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. I've enjoyed this. Good. Well, thank you for joining us. If you like the podcast, please like, comment, and share. This has been episode number thirty-seven. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>